Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to A Gathering Place. And today's topic is Start a Revolution, Grow Your Garden. And we're going to be talking with a special guest about gardening, uh, culture, and community. And we're going to bring our special guest in now, Miss Zenobia Hopper, founder Hello. of Gala Protect. Oh, what is it? Hello. Hello, Zenobia. <laughs> hey, I'm Marilyn. How are you? Um, I'm doing great. How are you? Founder, good, good. Founder of GPS, the Gullah Preservation Society of Georgetown, South Carolina, Inc. It's a long, Very good. it's a long name, but that's what it is. But we, the, so we call it GPS for short. We call it GPS for short because it's a mouthful. And I think it's so appropriate too. So it's it's directional. And uh, I tell us so why too. you started it. Yeah. Well, we started it because uh, my husband and I uh, founded it a couple years ago, and we did so because there really was not an entity that was focusing on the culture, the people, the language as it pertained to Georgetown uh, County, South Carolina. And to me, that's a big deal. Uh, oftentimes we are, people try to connect us to or attach us or have us be like a addendum to Charleston or other places, but the culture, the Gullah culture in Georgetown is certainly able to stand on its own. Georgetown County was the seat of rice. I know you hear me say this all the time. We were the seat of rice um, with rice production being off the chain in this area. And so we're not a addition to or an addition to any other part of this of the state when it comes to or the low country when it comes to rice production Gullah Geechee culture or any of those things and so just like Beaufort stands alone from St. Helena stands alone from Charleston we are uh, uh, our Gullah culture needs to have its own something that holds us together and people need to realize the importance of the Gullah people, the culture, rice culture, as it pertains to Georgetown County. Yeah, you and I have these conversations all the time. And I right. really, I tell people on behalf of the Gullah Geechee Chamber that Georgetown is the epicenter yes. of the rice culture. And, yes, and, people, and the average person just doesn't understand that because it's no. not taught in our school system. And it mm -hmm. really should be because even though it was a tragic, disturbing the original sin of our country, they did not bring over um, unskilled people. They brought no. over people with the, in, the intellect and the knowledge to create the rice culture. That's what they did. They enslaved people. They didn't bring over slaves. They enslaved Correct. people who had knowledge mentally and had physical strength to come over here. And they built it in Georgetown County. And a lot of That's people don't correct. realize that Georgetown was where many of the plantations were. And they had Charleston was where they had the second homes. So oh, when they yes. went, you know, society, a lot of the stuff that That's we look that. in Charleston now, people think of them as the first home and the main home. But right. a lot of those were the second homes because they went during the season to go socialize right. and they, while right. the enslaved were back making the money for them. Right. So you banked in Charleston, you partied in Charleston, you had this uh, a status and influence in Charleston. Um, Charleston was where a lot of money was spent and a lot of, uh, uh, it was the queen city. So that was the place where you put your good face on. But uh, the, the county of Georgetown was where you were, the land was, you know, the land was being uh, milked for everything that you can milk the land for and uh, enslaved African peoples uh, that you uh, brought to this or trafficked to this area for the purposes of creating uh, an economy, uh, that's where that's where it was. This is where it was all happening. This is where the money was made. Mm -hmm. um, Charleston mm -hmm. is where, they, where people saw the money, flaunted their money, flaunted their status, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, oftentimes the two things aren't in the same place. And so where the money was being made was here in Georgetown County. Yes, it, yes, it was. So it, that's um, one reason I wanted to talk about the culture and the community and the history of this area because it's all tied and I always 
I like to describe it as it's always a thread that runs through history that ties everything together. And it also leads to this community garden that you're working in and in, in, um, building now. And so my first question is, why the garden? Why are you starting a garden? And what is your mission with the garden? Well, the, the honest question about why is I don't really know. Um, it was really it was really given to me to do. Um, I didn't have any idea that I would be doing a garden. Nobody in a million years could make me get, <laughs> make me get out there every day and make this thing happen. Um, but the but the goal of the garden, as I was out there trying to figure out what was going to happen and the land was being tilled up and all of that, the goal of the garden became uh, number one to introduce or to try to introduce the young people and other other people in the community to the uh, historical crops that were grown by West African, um, our West African ancestors. Uh, it is true that there's not a whole lot written in, uh, for our for a student in this area around why the institution of slavery was so important and the role that uh, enslaved Africans played in the building of the, uh, in the building of the country. A lot of people don't realize we, we look at the, the history of the nation um, not from a Southern perspective. Do you see what I'm saying? And so a lot of people don't understand when the Southern portion of the elite white men, uh, when they said something, everybody else jumped because the power and the economics was here. And a lot of that was because of the institution of slavery and the, you know, the impact that all of this agriculture had on the rest of the uh, on the rest of the would be or or soon to be country. So we wanted um, young people to see what drove that. What were the historical crops that um, our ancestors not only uh, grew in this country, but uh, many of those things were brought to this country from the continent uh, of Africa, more specifically West Africa. Um, another thing that we wanted them to to experience is the care and the uh, growing of the food that we we eat. Uh, a lot of you know, a lot of us don't understand where the food comes from, what it looks like when it's in the ground, and how much time and energy and resources it takes to actually grow the food that we eat. Um, it just doesn't come out of a grocery store. Um, you 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 got to put some time into it, and especially as we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about the labor around agriculture. We want young people to to know and understand how much it takes to bring food um, food to the table. Um, another thing that we wanted to to do is to kind of create an example, a living example of the importance of land to community that the land that your houses are on or, or that your grandparents' houses are on, your neighbors' houses are on, and, and even abandoned uh, lands. But what your community sits on, the land that your community sits on is important and it's more valuable than we often um, give it. You know, we don't give it the value that it actually um, has. Uh, this uh, garden is a partnership between a bunch of different organizations and people. Um, the land belongs to a family and it's owned as heirs property. Um, and so we wanted to, to kind of show people how you can utilize the lands in your community to do things um, that are positive and do things that uh, work toward the community's betterment. Um, and also we wanted to create a living example of unity, of what unity would look like. So we're in partnership with a, a family uh, whose land we're using. We're also in partnership with Arnett AME Church, uh, which is right next door uh, to the garden. They provide us uh, water. Uh, we're also in partnership with a literacy program called Freedom Readers. Um, and they are, um, we are so thrilled that they are using this garden as this big old outdoor, ever-changing uh, classroom. Um so let me ask you, why do you think we don't value the land? I think that I think that the way many of us 
uh, uh, let me just speak for myself. Please I do. Think that, yeah, I think t- when 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 I was growing up, the the thing was to try to put yourself in a situation where you could better yourself. To try to take yourself someplace, to try to put yourself in a situation to better yourself, and bettering yourself sometimes wasn't, um, you didn't think about it as being home. You had to go someplace else in order to do better. Um, And I think that for many African-Americans in the South, that was the thing that we were taught. You leave, you take everything that you can take that we could possibly give you and go and find another place where you can better yourself because this isn't the place. And so uh, many of us leave and and spend extended periods of time away establishing businesses or careers or families. And um, I just think that it's not necessarily that there's a negativity around the land. It's just that we were taught that this was not the place that you could be successful. And the best thing for you to do for not only yourself, but for all of us is to go someplace else and find someplace else to be successful. And um, and so that was where the importance was placed for you to go someplace else and try to make a life for yourself because it was too hard here. Um, and as a result, you know, people get caught up in um, in their life and lifestyles, other places, and there's not enough time or energy or money or resources to really value what you left behind. But for me, what I realized in all of that trace been around the world is that there's nothing more valuable than what I left behind. And so that's where all the teaching is. That's where everything that I am, you know, came from here. And so you just try to do the best you can to um, pay some homage and respect to that. And to hopefully we're in a situation where our young people don't feel like they all have to flee in order to be successful in other places. So I think that's basically what it is. I think for historical reasons, we we can understand that. Because, um, you know, uh, if you look at the history of lynching, for example, many of the lynchings were for economic reasons that the white person saw a black person using and maintaining the land and they were building wealth. And whatever right. that triggered in that white person, because I can't speak for that white person. We know we could say racism, but we don't know what triggered the action, what was in their head. But the result of it was dead bodies, you know, strange fruit hanging in the trees because they saw a black pers- person prospering and they wanted that land. And if you peel back the layers of history on many of these lynching cases, you find out that after the person was lynched, the family was run off and the land was given to white people. And you see it all across the South. You see it in South Carolina. Um, I can't remember the case now, but I think there was one out of King Street in Williamsburg County. A family was run off their land and that land was taken by white people. Um, it was right. definitely done up in um, Edgefield. Um, Strom Thurmond territory that was definitely done then and I think their family's trying to come back now right. and either get an apology if not outright some claim to that land because it certainly wasn't done quote unquote legally so for historical reasons people did leave one be out of fear right they are you know they would be killed but also right. they left for opportunity. They saw in the North exactly. or the Midwest, we see better opportunity economically. I could send money back to my family. I could right. bring my family eventually up exactly. with me. And that's why most of us have family. You can literally follow the trails of where our families went, Connecticut, New York, you know, all up and down the, the east Eastern seaboard, then Chicago, Minnesota, California, you actually see the migration patterns. And um, I don't know if you read that book, The Great Migration, but it really speaks to that um, yes. overall story. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's very I, moving. So, I, yeah, go I ahead. Think anytime, I think that anytime, you know, I, I could use just a, a more uh, current example. When my mother started working at, she was one of the first women at Georgetown Steel. 
um, and um, she went there to feed her family. Um, and the, that was back in the 70s when the whole image of African-American women was around welfare and not being educated and, you know what I'm saying, and, um, you know, having kids that they couldn't afford and all that kind of stuff. And so coming down here, she was met with a lot of those stereotypes. But when she went into the mill and was working in the mill, people weren't fussing and hollering at her because of that, because she was a welfare queen or because she had too many kids. They were angry with her because she was in their space, what they thought was their space, taking their jobs. And mm -hmm. so they called her everything but a child to God, tried to run her out of that mill, tried to make her quit, tried to make things as dangerous for her as possible because they didn't want her there because she was in a place that they deemed to be theirs. And so it wasn't about her being... Um, uh, less than it was about her trying to strive to take care of her family on the same level that they were um, taking care of their families. And so oftentimes, whoever is in the power structure, wherever that power structure is, they have a problem with people trying to uh, to better themselves. And so uh, because who who would you who would you have you be able to keep your foot on? Mm -hmm. If these people rise up and do certain things. And so you see it, you know, you see it now. I mean, you know, you think about the movie Hidden Figures. Why we ain't know about that all of this time? Mm -hmm. You know, why don't we know about all of these things all this? on a major scale? It seems like as a nation, we'd be proud of all that stuff. But, you know, you got to keep people on the bottom if people, you got to keep a lot of people on the bottom if a few people are going to be on top. And so, um, so yeah, it wasn't about uh, lazy, shiftless, uh, good for nothing, uneducated, not knowledgeable people. They know better than that. You ain't, you ain't afraid of nobody who's all of those things. You are afraid of the people who might become your competition. You're afraid of the people who might do more, be more than your competition. Um, mm -hmm. And so you want things for yourself and you want to keep the power structure the way it is, period. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think a lot of that, I, I could imagine that there were a lot of uh, uh, women in my grandmother's age bracket that, you know, even though they missed their children, uh, sighed some relief when they were not here. Uh, and they were someplace else and creating stability someplace else because they knew how dangerous it was for their uh, young people to be in a segregated uh, Jim Crow um, violent South. And just as it was revolutionary at the time to leave for a better life, it's reversing itself now, itself now in many ways. The revolution is people returning home Right. You've retired, you've built a life, now you're coming back um, and you're rediscovering your roots. And part of our roots, even though we have trauma surrounding it, is growing things. The land, putting our hands in the soil. Um, that's, that's a lot of who we are, uh, wading in the water to go fishing to, to, for our sustenance. And now you're seeing in recent years, um, younger folks, and I'm I'm going to include our generation and 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 down. <laughs> We're still young, who are returning to our roots, and that's why I um, picked the theme of this show to be start a revolution, grow your garden, because it is returning to your roots, and that's a revolutionary act, and it's a revolutionary act for more than one reason. It's a revolutionary act because you're you're going back to your roots, and it gives you an understanding. And when you understand where you come from, it actually makes you stronger. It's a revolutionary right. act because you're not as dependent on the grocery stores. And that's very right. important and people need to realize that because what we buy in the grocery stores, it feeds us, but it doesn't give us nutrients because by the time it travels to where it was growing, to where it arrives in the grocery store, most of the nutrients are gone. And I started growing a garden a few years ago myself and last two years, I didn't have time to do it. But with this pandemic now, I said, I'm going to take the time. And my neighbor, Tawanda Ford, yeah. and we both said, we're going to take the time and put our garden together. And then I found out that you were doing a garden, which I thought was a great thing. Um, and it's revolutionary now because once that fruit starts coming, the veggies start coming and they're coming out. I get so excited. You know, I see my little baby tomatoes. Yes. Um, you don't. You, it's It's such a. 
it's a divine moment when you can stand in the garden and pick your tomato and put it immediately in your mouth. In your mouth, that's right. But that the taste of that it it will yeah. it, it opens a whole new world, and that's yeah. revolutionary because it actually loosens the ties. It loosens that foot on the neck, whether you realize it or not of going to that grocery store and spending your money where you literally are putting that sustenance in your body. And, right. and, and I think you and I've talked about that a little bit. And, and I think that's part of maybe why you also have um, created this garden. Maybe, I don't know. I don't want to speak. Yeah, I, wanna, I want, I think I want kids to be able to see it. Like I said, there was nobody in a million years can make me go out and do this now. So I, I you know, it's not that I think that people, you know, demanded that people should do this or, you know, I, I I just want young people to be able to see it for themselves and to know and have the connection between, I mean, we knew the connection between what you put in the ground and what comes out of the ground and what you put in your body. We knew that. And we're really not that many generations away from uh, backyard gardens and those types of things like that. Um, I want kids to and everybody to understand that if you had to, if you had to, you could put a seed in the ground and grow the things that you need to sustain yourself. Um, sometimes middle people are uh, middle men are good and sometimes it's not, but it's not a necessary thing. You don't have to go and do that. If you want a watermelon, you can grow a watermelon. If you want a tomato, you can grow a tomato. You can even grow things that you don't traditionally see in the grocery stores um, here. Um, you know that I'm an artist, and so part of the reason what I put in the garden was so kids could see color, could see texture, could see uh, shape, could see sizes, um, uh, different variations of the same uh, uh, fruit or vegetable. So we've got several different types of tomatoes several different types of cucumbers, several different types of um, okra, so that um, so that they can see that even the variety of food that they eat doesn't have to be dictated by what um, Kroger or Food Lion or any, you know, or Walmart decides that they want to put on their shelves. You can uh, put the time in and grow some of the most exotic things right here uh, on the land. So you, they may not ever have to um, put a seed in the ground, but I want them to know that if they had to, or if they wanted to, it is possible. And um, you know, I'm, you know, to feed yourself. Yeah, I'm glad you yeah. mentioned the thing about the type of foods that they put in the grocery stores because grocery stores are in the business of making money. Right. The product is to to give you food. It's not even necessarily the, they're 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 not in the business to feed you. They're in the business to sell you food to make a profit, and that's right. different from you know feeding you. And people need to realize that. And you, and what you know, ends up happening is they get hybrids. They they have a limited yeah. amount a type of food, right? Um, because they're about making money. So it well, does not expand your horizons, if I could put it that way. But go ahead. Right. You know what? Um, I had a conversation with Tim Chapman, who's a master gardener. He's also the godfather for this uh, garden. He's been wonderful in helping us n not make huge, huge mistakes. Um, and he was talking about a specific type of watermelon um, that is known for certain things. It has a, um, a thinner skin. It's a much sweeter taste, but it doesn't travel well. It doesn't transport well. And so you won't see it in a grocery store because it doesn't transport well. It doesn't mean that it's not a perfectly good fruit, but it just doesn't do well. And so just because of something like that, that a lot of times you don't even think about, um, you don't find certain things in the store and you wonder why, you know, why, wonder why you don't find certain fruits and vegetables, but it's because the shelf life isn't long enough. It doesn't take preservatives well. The color isn't as pretty as... Uh, as a certain, you know, something else. And so they, they, they ax it out just because of that. It's not that the, it, it, it's not good for your, you know, it's not good for your body it's because it's just not good for business. And that's so right. that's, um, right. um, that's not, you know, that's, that's not necessarily how we have to live. Um, I read something not too long ago about 
I did not realize that there were like a gazillion different types of bananas. I didn't realize there were so many different types of bananas because the only banana you see in the store is the yellow banana. Mm -hmm. They've got 80 million different kinds of bananas, but because they don't look right or they don't ship well, or they don't, like you can't refrigerate them or whatever they do with them, you don't see them in the, uh, in the stores. And now there's some kind of a bacteria or something that's collapsing this one banana that you see in the grocery store until mm -hmm. the whole industry is going to have to figure out what it's going to do because this particular bacteria or whatever it is, it's just taking out whole banana plantations now around the world. And so now they've narrowed it down to this one thing that's good for the grocery store. And now, you know, there's a yeah. backlash. Yeah. 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 And they've created these hybrid bananas for transportation right. purposes mm -hmm. or for you, for, 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 for capitalistic purposes. Exactly. And, and it actually opens it up to disease. It, and when it, it and that banana, it was a perfect example that you just gave. They didn't build it to resist that disease. And with climate right. change, um, things are coming back. There were, you know, we had forgotten exactly about right. or new things are happening and bananas collapse. That's a, just a prime example. But if you actually grow something, you grow a greater variety of watermelons, a greater variety of bananas, it actually creates a herd immunity. And I say that yeah. deliberately because during this pandemic, you hear herd immunity. That's what vaccinations are. Everybody can't get vaccinated for physical reasons. But you want most people to be vaccinated. You want a variety actually benefit. Right. And it also works that way in the food world. Mother Earth, nature has given us the answer. Through well, the if variety you, of foods to protect well, if you, us. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, um, if, even from a biblical standpoint, um, you know, when, when it's talking about what, how God created the earth, everything was created for man before man was created everything. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he created it in abundance. And so when, when not in our abundance, but in the universal God's abundance. Mm -hmm. And so there's an abundance of every doggone thing. And, you know, what comes out of the, or what used to come out of the oceans, what came out of lakes, what came, comes out of rivers, what comes out of the ground provides sustenance and healing for us. Now, what we do with that is, and the reasons why we do it, that's on us too. You see what I'm well, that's saying? That's where free will comes in. Right. That's where free so will comes in. Right. Like, sometimes you're praying to God for some foolishness that you done started, and I'm sure he's looking up there saying, look to yourselves <laughs> to fix it, because y'all only <laughs> want it. <laughs> I gave it to you. You know what I'm saying? I'm giving you so, it to you in abundance. I'm giving it to you in abundance. So if you all decided that you want to eat one banana, one hybrid banana for the rest of your lives because it ships better, that's your business. That, that don't have nothing to do with me because that's not what I've given you. I've given you way more than that. And so, um, yeah, so that's what I want um, all of us to know and understand and for our young people to understand that even at eight years old or at uh, 10 years old or at 15 years old, if you want to put a seed in the ground in your backyard, you can do that. And you can eat for the most part what comes from that um, from that seed. One of the yeah. projects that yeah. we're doing with the young people, um, well, let me back up. All of the activities that we're doing in the garden, Tracy Bailey, uh, who's the founder of uh, Freedom Readers, and Freedom mm -hmm. Readers are creating curricul curriculum around it. So if we do something, then they're creating this curriculum around it. Number one, okay. um, Marilyn, is that we don't know what school is going to be like. We don't know how we're going to have to reimagine our institutions and school being one of those institutions. We just don't know. And so um, to have them or to have Freedom Readers come out and create curricul curriculum around this garden is awesome to me because we as a community are going to have to figure out ways to supplement our kids education or educate our kids above and beyond what the school system will be able um, to do. And it's always been like that, but it's, it's more like that now because of, because of the, we're just not sure about what's going to happen um, in, in, in the new school year. And even there's some places like Dallas, they're already saying, um, no school to 2021. 
You know what I mean? So we're going to have mm -hmm. to figure out ways to educate and keep our kids engaged um, in learning and, in different and unique ways. So one mm -hmm. of the things that um, we are providing, we, we have this program where we have some of the kids that are part of Freedom Readers, um, they have become ambassadors for the garden. So they are GPS and uh, garden ambassadors. They are all Freedom Reader scholars that attend Freedom Readers at uh, Arnett AME Church. There are about 15 of them that will come, be coming into the garden and doing weekly uh, uh, things or weekly projects in the garden. So one of the things that they did first was they created my little garden signs. So the signs that we are using to help people identify where the food, where the fruits and vegetables are, that was one of their first um, projects. They'll be doing a naming ceremony uh, if the weather holds tomorrow and uh, I'm placing their signs all around the garden. Um, the, I think next week, and I'm looking forward to, um, to the lesson plan, but the, um, I think next week what we're doing is um, each of my ambassadors will be receiving a something that they need to take care of and to grow. So I think that I planted, um, let me see if I can get it in the picture. These are royal burgundy string beans. So each one of the kids will be getting one of the one of these string beans and their responsibility will be to take care of it and nurture it and be able to take it home and watch it go through all of its you know growth and hopefully the little beans will appear on that so they can kind of see in real time um how how their food grows and this is like i think two weeks less than two weeks worth of this growth. growth that we're looking at yeah. right now yeah so some things you know take a while other things don't take you know, take long at all. Um, so I'm excited um, for them to receive their uh, their vegetable and and see how well they're able to nurture it and, to, and take care of it, and keep it alive, and and see if they can't get them all back together and get at least a pot full of beans, <laughs> string beans, <laughs> they, can, they can cook and and try. Um, and you know, food tastes better when you grow it too. Well, I'm telling you, you grow it yourself. Have, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean. Um, uh, Tim Chapman gave us a cabbage out of his garden. Good God, that thing was good. Then I took it over to there my mom. right house. there. I, I, I got to find his picture with the cabbage. I took, I took that thing to my mama's house and picked it up the next day. You talk about good. I think we still got, if Jerry hadn't robbed me, if my husband hadn't robbed me, I think we still got a little bit left in the refrigerator. <laughs> that thing is good. <laughs> it is delicious. It really is. And there's something about knowing that he cut it that day mm -hmm. and my mom cooked it the day that it came out of the garden mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. phenomenal and he mm -hmm. can grow some big old collard greens and big cabbage and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah because the, the nutrients that the faster you get it to your table the more nutrients yes. the more flavors there and that's yeah. what that's that's what you're tasting right there yeah. and most people and don't realize you, that yeah and the less you cook it too with cabbage you ain't got to cook it all over. even though i like it cooked down you know, mm -hmm. to nothing. I like it like that too. But um, this particular time, she left it crunchy, and you know, it was it was really good. Well, many of the times we cook things down is because we're trying to get flavor into it, and people yeah. don't realize that when you get it straight yeah. out of the garden, you yeah, don't the have to cook there. it down as much because the flavor is there. You don't have to use as much salt. You don't have to use as much seasoning because the flavor is in there. And and going back to the salt point. It's one of the reasons we have actually too much salt in our diet is we're trying to replace the flavor that has been bred out of the food because Ooh, the, yeah. especially at factory farms, they they grow food for quantity rather than flavor right. and, they, right. and they grow it to make it look pretty rather than flavor. So you have to replace that flavor when you cook it. And that's why a lot of the ways we cook, people don't realize the historical reasons of why we cook. Not to say it's all bad. I mean, because right. we have. You know, as black folks, we we are artisans when it comes to cooking. But part of that is because we've had to do without or right. because the nature of where agriculture went. Mm -hmm. And most people you know, don't realize I, that. Yeah, I think that one of, one of the things that I really want to do more of is when when we I get a chance to travel and when we get a chance to travel more is to experiment more with different types of seasonings. And so that we're not just dependent upon Old Bay and salt and, you know, an accent. 
Um, I'm blessed in the fact that my daughter was a is a good cook and she was a good cook from way, way back. Um, and so she has been experimenting with seasonings for a long time. So I can't wait to get up to her, you know, and go to a, a, a seasoning market or herb market, or, you know, that kind of thing. And really start to bring that back to the area too, because um, there's more than just salt and black pepper and Old Bay and accent. There's, yeah. There, yeah. there are way yeah. more seasonings than uh, than that yeah. that help yeah. you um, not cover up the flavor of something, but to really enhance the flavor and bring out the flavor of certain vegetables and things like that. So um, that's was, something that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I, and I and I could I'm jealous of you of that. But one thing I did tap into unexpectedly in Walmart of all places, and I try not to shop there, but I was in there mm. one night and they were having a, a seasoning clearance mm-hmm. and there were African, Moroccan, mm. Mediterranean seasoning what? for like less than $2. And I was in there with my neighbor, Tawanda Ford, and we piled up on the Well, I'm, I'm and- coming to your house then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to you Give me some. <laughs> and mm-hmm. one in particular, I have already finished, but I'm holding on to the bottle because, I, of course, I'm not going to see it again because they were clearing it out. Um, yeah. In Walmart. I'm going to have to go online and find yeah, it. Yeah, look at the was, thing. Oh, oh, it was good. Really? It's good. So I'll, oh I'll, I'll, I'll definitely share the bottle with you. Yeah, man. I still have some of it in the house. I still have it. So I'll be happy to get it to you. So I've been showing some of these pictures of the mm-hmm. garden. I don't know if mm-hmm. you can see them. I'm going to put it up. But yeah. let's talk about this one in particular, because this one right here really, really is interesting to me. And I'll tell you why. Because the tagline, the slogan for the Gullah Geechee Chamber is making something from nothing. Oh, okay. And it has Gullah folks, as Black folks, we're used to taking stuff that we, the yes. found objects, and yes. making something more out of it. And I think this picture represents that so much where you've taken these tires and you've used yes. them as planters. So do you, what what do you have in these pictures in particular in the tires? Um, squash is in the uh, in the tires. I've got tomatillos in some of the tires, tomatoes in some of the tires. And then I got um, I don't even know in some of those tires uh, a, a woman uh, from Arcadia Plantation uh, her name is Helen Great. She gave me some plants. And when by the time I got out there, I was like, Helen, what is this? And she was like, I don't know. So I just threw them in. <laughs> I just threw them in the t- <laughs> I, I just threw them in there. Um, and to, uh, potatoes. Um, one of the members of uh, our Arnett uh, Church, Vern Hazel, he gave us some uh, potatoes start the you know potato starters and I was kind of nervous because it is kind of late for potatoes we put some of those in the tires and then we we planted a row of them and they are coming up so beautifully oh my god you can get a you can get potatoes according to Tim in less than a hundred days so um I'm excited to start pulling those out of the ground but we got those from this from the dump I called uh, Ray, uh, I called Ray Funny and he said, you know, go out there and get what you need. I took them to my mom's house and she painted mm-hmm. them for me. And they make awesome. Uh, they make awesome containers. Products. Yeah, they make yeah, awesome yeah. containers. So with these tires, did you put anything on the bottom of them, like cardboard or anything? Or are you are they just so directly it, on the ground? You know, some of them are directly on the ground. Some of them have a weed barrier on the bottom of them, like the potatoes do. But one of the things that the kids are going to um, to do at some point is to come and weed. And so I thought that it would be easier for them to get accustomed to weeding inside the boxes or inside the. Um, and Tim Chapman, those boxes, the the uh, the, the raised beds, came from uh, Tim. He he's letting us borrow some of the. Uh, raised beds from his wife Denise's. She used to do a garden with optimism, and so mm-hmm. we're borrowing her raised beds for that. But I felt like it would be easier for them to learn to weed in a in the in the raised beds and the tires. Um, you know, learning to discern what is good from what's bad, and pick what you know pick out what's not necessary and leaving the good and all that kind of stuff. We could probably teach that lesson better in the tires and the and the raised beds. Um, so yeah, and you know, um, bamboo, I use a lot of bamboo. The the uh, 
the for the trellis um, for the trellises yeah instead of going and buying the metal ones um they'll the of course the part that you put in the ground will rot but you know you could use those from year to year once the bamboo dries and um so most of the trellises you that you see are where cucumber will be and so hopefully the i'm trying to train the cucumbers to to trellis up instead of run along yes. the ground mm -hmm. yes yes very good i um i use you know every anyone who knows me knows i spent some time in politics and i use this the old metal stakes from the political yard oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that's a good and idea it's another way to make something from nothing yes. and I, I didn't want to yes. just throw them away so yeah. i reuse i reuse those to hold up my tomatoes in my yeah. garden and i, I like when i got bamboo too yeah so i used in this picture that's up now i've i've i put the a weed barrier on top because it was grass. It was a grassy property. And I knew that we were not going to be able to beat back that grass and those weeds this year. And so I used the weed barrier on the top to give, just to give the plants an opportunity to get a head start on the uh, weeds. And we um, um, have raked up tons and tons of, of uh, straw to kind of keep it all down. But I think those are the watermelon, uh, where my mel my melons are and they're about to run now. So they're running all over the place. So I'm really getting excited about that. Um, but there were a lot of, one of the things about gardening is there was a lot of things that I didn't know and just came into very, very naively. Um, but, you know, I'm, they're still it's coming. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's forgiving. You know what I mean? It's forgiving, but that's what we did this year to kind of try to um, give the plants enough time to, to over, to overrun the weeds instead of the weeds overrunning the plants. Yeah. My, the first year I did my veggie bed, it was a small bed, mm -hmm. uh, about the size of a double bed. If you okay. want to add them. I had the the basic garden because I didn't want to get disappointed. So I did the tomatoes. Yeah. Squash, tomatoes ain't that easy. Um, no. Okra. Well, to me, it was easy. Really? I have <laughs> I been, why, not been uh, easy for me. <laughs> and um, I, peppers, chili yeah, peppers. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And there was one more thing. I can't remember what it was. Now, I have not really been good with onions. I, for some oh, reason, onions, onions, I have onions good. this year, but for yeah. some reason, they really have not. You need a lot of water with onions. You really got to take uh, care of them. Yeah. They take a lot well, of water. But now, um, it's I raining today. I would actually be outside. If it wasn't raining, I'd be out here yeah. with the computer showing everybody. I think some of my onions survived. Uh, my beets are doing a whole lot better than I thought they were because we were late with that. Um, I've even planted Brussels sprouts, even though we're not the place for Brussels sprouts. But I wanted the kids to see how Brussels sprouts grow. I just think that it's a really neat um, looking vegetable when it's growing. So I'm hoping that it grows enough for them to see how it, you know, how it grows. But I've tried to give them or I've tried to plant as much of a variety as I possibly could um, so that the kids can see a whole lot of stuff. So you were saying, I'm going to bring up another picture with the kids doing the, the naming. And I think this is yeah. a plant. It's a watermelon. And so this yep. is a watermelon plant. Yep, that's a watermelon plant. And you, they just did that last weekend. That, it's, that watermelon is really running now because of this, the rain that we've had. Um, mm -hmm. But we thought that it would be good for them to make the uh, signs that were going to be in the garden. And it's also good for them to be able to start to identify the fruit before there's fruit on it. You know what I'm saying? This is what it looks like before the watermelon gets on it. And that's also a lesson for life. I mean, sometimes it's good to identify things early on, identify people early on. Sometimes, especially with people, by the time you start to see their fruit, it's too late. You don't be hanging with them too long. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. so... Uh, I just thought that that was a good idea for us to be able to take a picture with the plant in the in the young stages um, so that they can start to get accustomed of um, they can get accustomed to looking at things and identifying them long before, you know, the fruit appears. 
Yeah, and then I have another one here. I'm going to try to put up another. This is, I think this is, well, Hopi corn. Hopi, Hopi. and I'm going to say right. And yeah, that's an Hopi Indian corn, corn, so you're representing right. different cultures also. Well, yes, I think that one of the things, I, I don't know whether we're representing so many different cultures. I mean, I certainly do want a West African uh, culture represented in the guard with the rice, with um, with indigo. Um, I am going to be able to get my hands on some sugar cane. I was, uh, and that will be, yes, yeah, so you plant that this summer, but it'll come up in the, in the wintertime. So I'm excited about that. So, you know, sugar cane was something, especially in the islands that they planted, I mean, sugarcane plantations were huge and, yeah. and that kind yeah. of thing. But the, but the um, I did want to pay honor and respect to Native American and, and indigenous people in this area um, along what we now call the Gullah Geechee um, uh, corridor. There were 27 or more tribes of Native American um, peoples. Okay. And so um, some of the saddest um some of the saddest things about my research is that there's hardly anything in their narrative. Everything is in the narrative of the people who, you know, uh, well, and who uh, annihilated them. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just did that. We, so we, they, they plant um, in a fashion called the three sisters using corn, beans, and uh, squash because all of the plants uh, support one another in some way. And so I planted two plots like that in honor and respect of our and, and our indigenous brothers and sisters. Yes. And so those of you who don't know what she meant by supporting each other in, in, in some way, uh, one plant would provide ground cover. One would be the natural stalk. So one would grow up upon that plant. So they were the three sisters. They supported each other. And each that's other. how, yeah, they supported each other. So it's, it's actually very fascinating when you really get right. into gardening and realize. And it goes back to the whole thing about community. I mean, mm -hmm. even this project, if the church didn't provide us water, we wouldn't be able to do it. If the landowners didn't provide us the land, we wouldn't have been able to do it. If GPS um, did not provide um, the labor and the resources and the and the vegetables and the seeds and stuff, nothing would happen. Um, if G if uh, Freedom Readers didn't come along and create a whole new way for this thing to be relevant, it would be a much smaller project than it has to be or should be. And so it really is a living example of how we are all interconnected and how we have to, everybody do our part, we of 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 course we um we are individuals and we we need to pursue individual things but there needs to be things and places in communities where people work for the whole and work for the common good and so i'm hoping that because the, the garden is right on a, a major street, Merriman Road, people can see it from the road. They can mm -hmm. see things as they grow up and get excited about it, that um, that people from other neighborhoods see that we are doing things in this neighborhood, and also people within the neighborhood see what could be done um, in their own neighborhoods. Brooklyn yeah, Garden. Go ahead. And what were you saying about Brooklyn yeah. Gardens? Brooklyn Gardens is a nice place to visit. It is beautiful out there, um, but it but our kids don't have to go out to Brooklyn Gardens. I mean, they're not they're not even it's not even available for them to go to Brooklyn Gardens every day. But in your own neighborhood, you can walk around the corner, ride your bicycle, and you can see things growing every single day. That's right. And, and I, I hope we get back to the days where when I was a child and visiting my grandmother, she had an apple tree, a pear yeah. tree, a pecan tree, and yeah. two fig trees in her backyard. And I did not realize that figs were considered a gourmet oh, plant yes. until oh. I was well into my 20s because you just went to your grandmother's backyard yeah. and you had to fight the birds for the figs. Mm -hmm. You know, we would get upset because when you turn the fig around, the bird yeah, would the birds had eat the back of the fig, and yeah, you're thinking you had yeah. a good fig, and you pull it off, and yeah. oh, you know, the bird, and you yeah. just, just throw it down yeah. on the ground. I mean, you, we would just go in the backyard and get all these fruits and vegetables. I got some folks saying hello here. I'll make sure. Okay, Denise said she told Tim I want some sugar cane. Oh, <laughs> Hi, I Denise. 
and tell Denise that I have already called him and I will make sure they get sugar cane. <laughs> I'm sure she heard that. Hi, Hattie and Jerry. Jerry's making this. There will be plenty. I can't tell what that is. It looks like radish. I don't know what that plant oh, is. Oh, <laughs> radish. Hi, Dave Herman. And hi, John Smalls. Um, thanks for joining us today. And um, let me see here. You've had some good volunteers out there. Here's a picture of Natalie Days. Oh, Stop Natalie by. Days. And let yeah. me tell you something. She automatically came. She just started pulling weeds. I'm telling you. <laughs> she started pulling <laughs> weeds as soon as she got there. <laughs> she and her daughter came out one um one day, um, my uh, my good girlfriend Leslie Graves Moore, she came out and spent uh, this past Sunday um, uh, volunteering and helped me put some eggplants in the ground. Um, I had a wonderful young man, and I want to be able to post his uh, uh, picture on Facebook, but I need to get his permission first. That young man was 27 years old. He came out. After his job, that boy came out. At, he's not a boy. He's 27. But I mean, he's a young man to me. Mm-hmm. After mm-hmm. his work, girl, and he busted a sweat for about three hours with us. And that's where we planted the corn and stuff was where he worked. And I mean, he just did it. Tim was out there and he was so eager to learn about gardening. He says he has a one year old. He's trying to already get our hands in the ground and stuff like that. I was so encouraged by this young man. I really was. And I appreciate it him three hours that he gave us um people have been dropping things off for us from uh Tawanda brought us uh, more than a dozen tomato plants i mean we've done it, it's it's just been an amazing experience and it really has um been don my uh, one of my board members don kimbrell is helping me with trying to provide um projects and activities and stuff for the kids to do um i can just go on and on with the amount of people that have been coming out and just lending their um their their help their um their resources you know money you know it really has been bringing people together oh i see your garden (laughs) yeah yeah i just because it was raining and i couldn't come out earlier but this is the garden mine is in pots i do have a small bed but mine's in pots this year and it's tomatoes cherry different types of tomatoes like you say variety heirloom tomato which is actually more disease resistant than hybrids. Yes. Um, cilantro. I have pineapple sage here. Oh, I want some pineapple sage. This is right here. <laughs> oh, I want some of that. Yeah. Well, you oh, can have some because so I. beautiful. Oh, yeah. It, I want some of that. It's very thick and rosemary, some more cilantro, thyme. Lots of tomatoes, sweet potatoes. These are my sweet potato pots right okay. here. I don't know if everybody okay. the big pots of my sweet potatoes here. And as you said, a good rain today. Yes. And right here, I have wildflowers. I don't know if everybody, I might have to move out the way. But these are my wildflowers oh, yeah, coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I need to attract bees. Yes, bees you are do. so important. Yes, bees you do. Bees are so important. So um, I have. you might be able to see my cats. But this is right outside my driveway, the carport of our house. And so it stopped raining, so I just dashed out here. And I have lots of okra because I love okra. Love okra yes. tomatoes. And I don't fry mine. I saute them together in yes. a block. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, this is this is my gar- part of my garden. I have another section on another part of the yard. And okay. um, and I still have some some peas coming in. Don't ask me what kind. Tawanda oh. gave them to me. And they're <laughs> growing up. And I have carrots. And let me tell you this. Yes, I have I'm carrots about, too. Making something out of nothing. All right, oh, look if you at can that. see that. So yes, that's, that's the, the that's the yeah, shipping this, packaging. It's the shipping packaging. Um, my aunt's TV went out the other day, so I had to go buy her a TV. And I was looking at it. I'm like, I hate. I always try to recycle. I hate throwing yeah. things away, especially plastic, because plastic never goes away. No, it said, doesn't. You know, that would be perfect for carrots because it's long. It's very vertical yes. and deep. So I have carrots going in that, and um, and um, yeah. So that's mine this year. Oh, that's I'm amazing! Doing. Yeah, and I have two cats. I don't I know if you heard you. them. Yeah, but they're my they're my garden cats. They hang out with there me. There you go. Yeah, yeah. But I wanted to show that while it stopped raining and okay. everything. I love gardening. Yeah. So so as you were saying, I'm sorry. I started. That's <laughs> and I'm back in my house now. So. 
Um, all right, here we go. Here we go. So, um, so what what are you looking for, Zenobia? Any more volunteers? Oh my God, yeah. I mean, if people want to come out and and um and and volunteer, that would be awesome. If people want to just come out and bring their young people to come and look and and see, especially as things start to uh to get up. And you actually, there's fruit on the uh, on the on the plants. I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for people to come and and just check it out. You know, I'm hoping that it will inspire people who want to do this. Like I said, I don't think that it should be done as any kind of this is what we what you have to do. But I'm hoping that the mm -hmm. just having the garden in such a prominent place on Merriman Road, um, number one. Um, helps people to think about community and think about unity and think about ways that we can uh, work together to do things. And um, I'm I'm hoping that um, younger people, younger than than younger than us, to see it as something sexy to do. You know what I'm saying? Instead of going out to the bar all the time, go on out to your own garden and and and, and open up a bottle of wine and fix a romantic dinner and you know hang out there and 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 and, and figure out ways to make uh uh vacant lots uh, beautiful again to grow food again to uh kind of uh, come together as community again so um whatever people have that they want to donate that is useful for a garden i would be appreciative of it if we can't use it we will pass it along to an individual gardener or someone else who is um who is who is doing gardening? Uh, I also want to let people know because my I don't know if you heard my husband in the background hollering. Don't forget to say this. Don't forget. To say this. <laughs> I did hear. I didn't understand what it was. <laughs> He's crazy, but um, we are going to do a pumpkin patch for the kids. So that is my goal: is to have a pumpkin patch for the kids, and we want a pumpkin patch. We want a great pumpkin pumpkin patch. I have ordered. All kinds of crazy. <laughs> I want to. I want to. Um, I've ordered all of these great pumpkins, just like I said, because of the artist in me, um, shape, size, color, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. So we're hoping that we, you know, we can we yeah, can get them a neat pumpkin patch. People don't realize pumpkins come in more than just orange. Exactly. <laughs> and you know what? Yeah, I did yeah. not realize that there are some pumpkins that you can store for three months. I mean, they'll just sit for three months and the seeds are edible. The skin is edible. The meat is edible. You can make something. You can make sauteed uh, pumpkin uh, steaks that are nutritious. You can make something sweet like a pumpkin pie, a pumpkin bread. It is a very versatile, um, whatever it is. Is it a gourd or it's not a fruit? It's a gourd. Isn't it? I, I, or vegetable. Is it a squash? Maybe it's a squash. I don't know. I have to look and see. I have to get. I have to get up on my on my pumpkin knowledge, but it is full of a lot of the, uh, you know, the vitamins and nutrients that we need. It's it is um it is storable for a long period of time, and so much of it, even some of the leaves are are good to eat. So it's a it's an interesting, whatever it is, it's interesting. I um years ago purchased a book my mother and i so this is quite a while she's been gone i think 12 years now um mm -hmm. and the, the title of that book was food f-o-o-d and it was a picture book a, a table uh -huh. coffee table yeah, yeah, book, table type book. and yeah. they only had pictures of food so they had a section wow. just a squash and it just had i mean just dozens it was a pretty thick book yeah dozens yeah. of pictures of different type of squash and wow. I just fell in. I think that was when I started really kind of falling in love with food again for food yeah. sake. And just to see the different types of pumpkins, the different type of squash. Yes. I love squash. I love yellow, yes. crooked neck squash, yes. green yes. squash, zucchini, yes. uh, acorn, uh, spaghetti, all that. And you don't realize the variety because in the grocery store, once again, you only, it's about right. making a profit rather right. than um, expanding your palate, expanding exactly. your experience. And and that's a cultural thing that we're getting back to. And I think mm. many of us and hopefully more of us will start growing our food. So, I mean, it's a wonderful thing that's I think that's happening. And, and it's good to see that you're part of it. But you're right. I mean, what we're missing out on when we don't grow our own food 
the the nutrients, the the, the expanding our horizon just in, when yes. it comes to our food, and also it's a healthy thing. It you is, and also to your, your, yeah. your and and to start and to and to start to break the imaginary dependence upon certain systems. Everything that we are, or we think that we are dependent on, we are not necessarily dependent upon that. Mm -hmm. It takes some time, it takes some energy, it takes a little bit of money. But once um, Tim Chapman said to me, now, now that you've established this spot, it will get easier and easier every year to keep it, uh, um, to keep it established um, or to continue to establish, establish it. Um, and you can break some of the ties to things that you, that are not necessarily good for you. So if you, you know, if you eliminate the middleman on your tomatoes and your cucumbers and your, you know, whatever, you can use that money to buy something else. If you mm -hmm. get into a relationship with somebody who has chickens and buy chickens from them, you're supporting somebody local and you're eating something that's, um, that's fresh and, 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 and better for you. So we need to start to learn how to reimagine um, the how the ties that bind us. Mm -hmm. and, and, to, and to read to, to rethink those things because everything is not necessary in all cases. You see what I'm saying? And yeah. I, I, I ain't mad at, at capitalism. I'm I got a little bit of capitalism in me too. Okay, just a little bit. All mm -hmm. right. So I'm not. That's not what. My, my, yeah, that's not my thing. But you don't have to. One. It's one thing to have to do something. It's one thing to think that you have to do things a certain way. And you don't have to do it and be miserable about it. And you don't have to do it. You put a seed in the ground. One seed sometimes will give you tons and tons of, of abundance. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, somebody donated some uh, tomatoes to us. He said he sliced the tomato, put it between, um, put it between the dirt and got 300 plants. That's the type of abundance from, a, from the universal God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's 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 the type of abundance that was given to us as mankind, and we have to be able to tap into that. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, one year I helped my aunt Mo. She won a cherry tomato plant at a church, but bazaar, whatever they yeah. had. And I said, we gonna put that potato, that tomato plant, in a pot, and we gonna grow it. We nursed that right. one plant all summer. And she got her cherry tomatoes from there. And it was just one, such a bonding experience yes. for us together. Because yes. I would make sure I yes. go by her house and water it and stuff. Yeah. So she, and her, she in her 90s now. And I think she was like 89 wow. when we did it for 90. And it was just some time that we could spend together. I can tell you how many times yeah. we stood around that one plant in her carport. Yeah. And talking about it. And plucking off the little cherry tomatoes, cherry tomatoes and, them. Yeah. and it really it was that was the abundance yes and it brought us together and now as i'm growing part of what i'm doing now of course i'm going to take her some that's the community of that's yeah. the community of it. and it's that's yes. the revolution of it is it, it's breaking those ties to the commercial commercialism commercialization yeah plant. You yeah. know, removing of everything. that middle man. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. It's, and, it's, and the, it's the little seeds that create the bigger seeds that yeah. will change and create the revolution. That's the, that's right. And sometimes it's the, the revolution is in the mind now. Sometimes mm -hmm. the revolution is in the mind. And so mm -hmm. changing that mindset and breaking chains that you, sometimes the, ch the chains have are, are gone, but we still walk around dragging them like they're still, like they're still, uh, you know, sh we're still yeah. shackled. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it, it's a wonderful way to, for your kids to exercise, to get them out into nature. You can't hardly go no place, no how. So, you know, if they're growing something in their own yards, I hadn't had to worry about no hairstyle. I hadn't had to worry about no nails did. I hadn't had to worry about what I was going to wear. None of those things that are not that important, especially now during a pandemic, you know what I mean? I hadn't had to worry about any of those things every day, get up and and work and, and have this wonderful uh, spiritual experience in the garden um, and knowing that I'm doing something that will sustain hopefully many people. 
Um, we are trying to figure out, the, the kids are going to, my ambassadors are going to be the ones that get to decide what happens to the majority of the food. So we're going to put that decision um, to them. Um, so we'll see what they come up with. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll see mm -hmm. what they come up with. And another thing that I wanted to say, Marilyn, is that it has given me time. Um, being in the garden has given me time and opportunity to really just kind of vibe on the types of situations that my great, 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 great grandmother and grandfather had to deal with. And so um, I'm in there with my rubber boots on. I got a hose. I got buckets and and, and, and all the tools that I need, I've got everything and I'm there by my own choice. And whatever happens to whatever is produced, we get to make the decision about that. And so I am so uh, conscious of the fact that I come from people that didn't have that opportunity. She didn't have rubber boots. She didn't have socks. She didn't have a hose. She didn't have even her own self. You know what I'm saying? And she wasn't, and everything that she created, everything that she built, everything that she um, produced was for somebody else. And she was totally disconnected from it. And sometimes not even left with enough food for her and the kids that she was, al were, was allowed to keep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really, I really think about that. And it, br it brings forth in me this level of gratefulness that I don't want to... You know, when you're young, you waste a bunch of stuff like your time and energy and stuff like that running behind, you know, stuff that don't really make no, no mm -hmm. difference. But I really have been able to I'm not going to say now I know how she feel because I don't know how she feel. And I don't want to know that. I just yeah. want to be grateful for the fact that my great, 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 great on and on held on. She held on and she survived. Yeah. So that I can be yeah. here to yeah. do what the hell I wants to do. I thank her yeah. for that. I really yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. And I I I I'm totally understand. I understand yeah, where you're coming from. When you get in that garden, you do reconnect. Yeah. You do reconnect with your, your roots and who you are. And I think I already told you my personal story after my mother passed and I was in my first garden yeah. that I did. From the yeah. ground up, and I literally felt my heart start mending itself from from that deep grief when you lose yeah. the person, that person so close to you. Mm, and I was yeah. in the garden with my hands I'm in that soil, and I literally felt my heart start to mend itself after my mother's death. And that I'll tell you that garden. That's why to this day I'm just I have an emotional attachment, attachment to growing mm -hmm. my own food. It, 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 I it don't remember. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember who I told that story. I didn't use your name, but I mm -hmm. told somebody that story because that thing touched me so. You know, it touched me so much. Um, the things that we have forgotten um, that heal us. You know what I mean? The things that that we have forgotten that that uh, that heal us. Um, uh, Natalie's daughter, uh, Sarah, came out and she talked about dance and movement, body movement as a way that we heal each other. I'm one of those people that did my bout with antidepressants and them thing. I'm not saying this for not for everybody. Some people might need it, but that thing, them things ain't for me. Mm -hmm. I need to find other things and other ways and other activities to 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 heal, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's amazing that the things that we have forgotten that that heal that heal us. And that story to, and the fact that you told me that in the garden was deep too. So mm -hmm. I did share that with somebody, and it it took their you know it was very touching to them as well. Um, and I, you know, I know it's true. Even the, like I know it's true. Like I was there when it when when it happened to you. I know it's true. Um, yeah. So whatever it is that we do as a community and whatever we do as a people, um, we've got to figure we got to figure this stuff out for um, for ourselves. Because I'm gonna tell you a secret, Marilyn. Ain't nobody coming to save us. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I know that. I know that. Ain't nobody coming to save me. <laughs> no, if you ain't saying, ain't nobody coming. <laughs> we got to save ourselves. We got to save ourselves, girl. Mm-hmm. Ain't nobody coming. Mm-hmm. So you passed mm-hmm. that secret along as the people, some people got that thing twisted. That's they right. waiting. That's they right. waiting. They great. They, they waiting, waiting, they waiting the... for that night and coming in Ooh. the shiny armor on that white horse. And oh my God! Here to tell you that ain't going to happen. Come. Anita it Baker had a Anita Baker had a song called No Fairy Tales. Have you ever heard that song? Play yes, it I again. Have. Mm-hmm. Ain't mm-hmm. nobody coming to save you. Now they might come to take you away. <laughs> but they ain't coming to save you. They ain't coming to save no, you. They are That's not coming right. to save you. So the whatever That's we right. can do, however we can do, in in ways that we can um, um, come together and unite, we have to know and understand that finally and once and for all, you got to save yourself. That's right. And, That's and gardening right. and this. You know, this community garden, I'm hoping, will be a living, growing, um, ever-changing example of just one of the many ways that we can make that happen. Well, Zenobia, I can't say anything more after that. So this is a good way to end the show. Yes. And I want to thank you for joining me today during a gathering place. Thank yeah. you. And thanks thank you. to everyone that has helped that has helped with this effort. Everybody who has done every anything to help this effort. I appreciate you guys uh, so much. I know you do. So to remind everyone, she's the garden is right next to Arnett AME Church right. on Merlin Road in Georgetown. Nine hundred North Merlin Road. All right. And if you want to stop by and just help out. Um, it's, if you're not sure about gardening, but you want to help out so you can learn a little something and maybe start your own thing later on, it's a good way to get involved and just get yes. your hands in that soil and make and some, stay tuned some because Tim, Tim Chapman is, um, we're trying to get together a gardening uh, class this fall. So hopefully, depending upon what our social distancing things are, are or what's happening in the fall, look forward to some workshops with uh, Tim Chapman to have a master gardener in your community. Ain't no small thing. No, it's not. I mean, it's it's not a small is, thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And no, he's, he's awesome. And he's excellent. And he, he he's shares excellent. his knowledge. That's the yes, thing. He, he does. He yes, gives he it does. so willingly. And, and yes, I know Denise, as she's still on here, is very proud of her husband. And yes. She and she should be, be gives, true. He, she should be. So willingly. And everything. Yes. So yeah. So and look I'm, forward to that class. I certainly will. So as we get closer, I'm going to bring you guys back on. As a matter of fact, Tim is going to join me and with Jermaine Jenkins of Fresh Future Farm in North Charleston on July oh, 1st. And Zenobia, I want you to come on back to that show okay. also. And I'll okay. have all three of you on. But we want to thank everyone for joining us today at a gathering place. Um, creating our own revolution, grow your own food. And that's the first step and to break those chains that bind us and we don't even realize. And we want to thank Zenobia Harper and her Mm -hmm. husband in the background, the voice, the (laughs) voice of her husband. (laughs) I'm going to let him know he's a star. eh? Thank you. (laughs) All right. (laughs) We heard that voice occasionally. (laughs) But tell him we said thank you for joining us also. All right. And uh, and we'll catch you next time. We want to remind everyone our next show is this Sunday at 4 o'clock. So please come on back to Facebook Live at the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce. And we're going to have some, I don't know what the show is yet, as a matter of fact, but I'm pulling some It'll stuff be together. Good. <laughs> but this is going to be, be good. good. It's going to be good. <laughs> well, Zenobia, thank you. And you have you a good rest of your day. All, All right. right. Good night. Thank All right. you. Bye-bye. Ha, ha, ha.